Trinity's economic prosperity with the YW Calgary. Today, Trinity and I will be your hosts for the event. Thank you, Megan. So, um, I just want to um, say thank you everyone for attending our event tonight. Um, my name is Trinity and I am a healthy relationships community animator with the YW Calgary. Before we go any further, I would just like to recognize a, a land acknowledgement. So as we gather today virtually close to the merging of two rivers on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and peoples of Treaty 7, including Sigsiga, Pigani, Gainai, Sutina, and Stony Nakoda First Nations, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nation. The city of Calgary is also home to Metis Nation of Alberta, region number three. And I just also want to acknowledge that we are gathered today virtually to ensure the safety of our viewers and of our guests as we continue to experience um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you all for your patience as we navigate this virtual world together. Thank you, Trinity. So in Alberta, November is Family Violence Prevention Month. And it's an opportunity to, for us to continue raising awareness of this critical issue and to advance YW's, YW Calgary's work to prevent and support families impacted by domestic violence. To help women gain control of their lives, achieve economic security, and live free of violence. YW continues to support and to promote social change by partnering with donors, government, social service agencies, and community members. Um, to extend opportunities for women by providing supportive emergency and transitional housing, access to our shelter, outreach and counseling for those who experience abuse, as well as for perpetrators. YW Calgary's mission is to intervene, empower, and lead when and where women need us the most. We believe that healthy families lead to thriving communities. We are very excited to host this virtual webinar today as active agents of change during Family Violence Prevention Month. We are so honored to share this time with so many of you who have joined us today for our very first Activism Through the Arts event. YW Calgary is the longest and longest serving and largest women's organization in Calgary. For more than a century, we have touched the lives of thousands of women and individuals and have continually evolved our programming to meet the changing needs of women in our communities. YW Calgary's focus on women's economic prosperity includes working with multiple partners um, to develop domestic violence solutions and action-based plans at the community level, to implement and support prevention strategies within the community, and to empower community members to take action in their very own neighborhoods. This issue is incredibly relevant to us as Canadians. A study from the Canadians Women Foundation found that 67% of Canadians know a woman who has been physically or sexually abused. Additionally, the Calgary Police Service respond to approximately 30,000 domestic violence calls per year. The reality of domestic violence and gender-based violence against women in every quadrant of our city Becoming educated and aware can be the first steps we take to becoming activists ourselves. At YW Calgary, we contribute to creating safe communities by leading a commitment of violence-free living in our city. When women feel safe, they are able to thrive in their relationships. We aim to empower women to pursue their ambitions and to participate equally and meaningfully at all levels of economic decision-making and to focus on wellness and healthy relationships with the intention of thriving. So for this evening, we wanted to bring our community together by highlighting the incredible works of two local artists and how each of them have used their gifts and their platform to educate about the realities of domestic violence and gender-based violence. Firstly, we'll be hearing from Miriam Ijaz, 
an independent filmmaker who will be screening her short film, Purple Kisses, with us this evening. Purple Kisses is the story of a young woman desperately trying to navigate her life through an abusive marriage and without any support from her immediate family. Purple Kisses has also been selected for awards in multiple film festivals, including the International Film Festival of South Asia, Liftoff Global Network Toronto, the Stinger Awards, the Mosaic Film Festival for Arts and Culture, Sunfest International Short Film Festival, Vesuvius International Film Festival, and Fentress Film Festival. And finally, we'll be joined by Claudia Chagoya, an interdisciplinary artist whose practice explores topics related to gender-based violence and her socio-political background, having been born in Zacatas, Mexico. Claudia is a highly educated and renowned recipient of many awards, grant programs, and has had her work exhibited internationally. We are so grateful to have her join us this evening and for her to share with us her journey and highlight her most recent project, A Rose for Remembrance, which can be found at the Ledge Gallery in the Calgary Arts Common. Throughout the event, we welcome you to post your questions to our guests through the chat function. We wanted to let you know that you can pop out this chat window on screen by clicking the chat icon box at the bottom of your screen. We will be asking these questions during the second half of our event during our Q&A period. So before we hear from our guest speakers, we want to thank you all so much for being here today. We need your support to create a community committed to violence-free living in Calgary. Activism through the arts is impactful in prevention work. And all of you here today are supporting meaningful change in our communities. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first guest speaker, Miriam, who will talk about her journey as a filmmaker, followed by a preview of her film, Purple Kisses. Take it away, Miriam. Hi, um, thank you so much for having me um, for this event. It's really, honestly, just a great honor. Um, as we were talking earlier, like I didn't know um, that much about YW, but I've gotten to know so many things about it. And um, the like bringing the film and you guys showcasing it and then all the services you have, I think it's just such an amazing thing. And I hope people really get to see that today and um, reach out to those resources if they need it. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, we are just so thrilled to have you here and to be able to showcase your film. So as you begin, I would just love to know if you can share with us a little bit more about your journey as a filmmaker or what led you into that kind of um, artistic expression. So um, film has always been a huge part of my life. Like growing up, my dad loved all movies. So I've been watching films since I was really young. Um, I also found out like recently, my granddad was a huge film lover as well. And this is back in Pakistan where he would like go to um, all these different like theaters and it wasn't like that common, but he would just go to watch films and stuff. So I think it's definitely something I just love. But I think um, the thing that attracted me to film was the way um, it changed my perspective on the world because I grew up in the Middle East. Um, and so it was my life was just my home, my school, and I didn't have that much exposure. So the only exposure I actually had was through films. So it was just really create, like great to be able to see all these different worlds that were created by all these different people. Um, so I think it was always something I wanted to uh, explore because storytelling is a huge part of my life. I've been a writer since I was like very young. Um, and I think I'm a very visual person. So uh, those two things just kind of came together. Um, so with film, it's something I wanted to do since I graduated high school um, and I applied to SAIT at the time and I didn't get in and I felt like I wasn't ready for it. So I kind of went and did a degree in English. Um, and I think at, in those years, I was really building myself and growing and getting to know myself and understanding what's important to me. But I remember before I graduated, I was like, I have to try and explore filmmaking. Like I cannot just like not try it what if I could do something with it it was just a lot of fear that was holding me back but I had to face it so um, that's how I started and um, I was really lucky because I got selected uh, by this mentorship program called Herland uh, they the program basically gets uh, five women from different um, uh, like sections of like cinematography writer director and then editing um, and and then you, if you get selected, I got selected for the writer director. And then if your film gets selected, you get like 
free equipment, you know, you get a cinematographer, then you can bring your team. So, and you get mentorship. So that was actually how Purple Kisses was able to become possible. Before that, I worked on a few other films um, to get some more experience, just like be in that environment to get used to what a film set looks like. Um, so that's how I started. And that's how um, I think so far film has been for me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Miriam, for sharing and what an incredible journey you've had um, and, you know, an incredible career so far, even though, you know, you're still so young. Um, I would also love to know, you know, you, so you started and you had this opportunity through a grant program, but really what was the inspiration behind the film Purple Kisses and, you know, why did you want to share that kind of a story? So I think for me, um, like, I'm, I'm Pakistani, so I have a South Asian uh, culture, um, you know, abuse and all these things are th that, that they are common and they're not talked about, like they're really taboo topics. I also, with my degree in English, I have a minor in women and gender studies. So um, that getting that minor really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, and I think it made me realize how important these issues are. And I think with Purple Kisses, because it's a poem I wrote like three years before I made the film. So in 2017, um, and it was just something because I was into poetry and stuff. So when I was going to make my first film, I felt like it had to be something that meant a lot for me so that I can really put in my everything because it's so hard. Like film, it's, film is hard, especially when you're starting out because you really don't understand what's happening. And I'm kind of a perfectionist. So I'm like, it needs to be perfect. <laughs> Never, nothing can. So I, I kind of tend to stress myself out a little bit. Um, so I think that was one of the reasons why I felt like if I was going to do something and put in my 100%, it had to be something that I was passionate about. And I didn't want to do something that wasn't going to bring out a change and a difference because that's always been something like I didn't want to feel like, okay, what? Yeah. And I, I'm not saying like if the, you if somebody makes something and that, that isn't, that's not good. Like I watch a lot of movies just for entertainment, but I think um, this was for something I felt that um, as a first film, um, I wanted to make an impact and also see like how I would be creatively uh, be able to represent that. So um, I think being able to show all these issues or, or this main issue, for example, because I've seen it growing up, like, you know, you hear stories and there's so many things that happen and you're just like, okay, why isn't anyone talking about it? And it, it came to a point where when I was, before I did this film, I did a lot of research for it um, about, especially in Canada, like the South Asian community and how those struggles are. Cause I wanted to, it to be inclusive, but I also did represented it from like, like a South Asian uh, perspective. Um, and I think from that, I, I realized like, this is very important to talk about. And the only way we can start a conversation is maybe by making this film. And so today this is like perfect because it's it's what I wanted. So, yeah. Awesome, thank you. And I just have one last question before we get, you know, before we actually watch the film itself, but I would, you know, what is really your hope for those attending today? And what kind of message of encouragement would you like to share with them? Yeah, so um, I feel like one of the things is, um, I would say like get comfortable with the discomfort. Uh, I think that's very important with the topics like these. Um, another thing, the reason why it's taboo is like people don't want to talk about it. And sometimes, you know, we always give ourselves excuses like it's not my business or this and that. And I think it's important to be aware of what's happening um, around you because I think even if it's not us like, like being part of that issue or that abuse, if we know about it, we are responsible. That's how that's how I see it. I think we as humans are responsible for uh, each other. And um, it is important to be aware of that and, and take it as a responsibility so that you can do something. And sometimes it's just about listening to the person, you know, not even giving advice, just like listening so they feel like they're not alone because um, at the end of the day, the strength comes from within, right? So um, I feel like I hope that, you know, people can obviously like see that YW has all these resources. So if there's someone who needs that help, they can go and reach out for that. Um, and other than that, just, you know, people can reflect on and educate themselves because that's the most important thing. Because when we educate yourself, you understand more and it becomes very personal because you've put an effort to understand a topic. So you take a better stand. So that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Miriam, for all of your wise words and for letting us know a little bit more about this journey. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now and then we are all going to actually watch Miriam's short film, Purple Kisses. It's only 11 minutes long. It's not, you know, we're not gonna be sitting for, for too long, but um, I just think what a great opportunity this is uh, to be able to 
to watch this all together. So I hope that my screen share actually works um, and you can let me know in the chat box if it is. और कुछ नहीं आप सुनाए आप कैसी है अलहमद लाला मैं बिल्कुल ठीक हूँ मेरा निवासा कैसा है वो भी ठीक है अच्छा बेटा मैंने आपसे एक बात करनी थी मैंने हसन को फोन किया था लेकिन उसने उठाया नहीं उस दिन आपके अबू को गिफ्ट किया था उसने तो मैंने कहा कि उसका थैंक यू क्या देती हूँ अच्छा मम्मी वो शायद काम पर बिजी होगा जब वो घर आए तो मैं उसे बता दूंगी अच्छा चलो ठीक है मेरा बेटा अपना ख्याल रखना The silent cries in the middle of the night are ones that do not end for some women. Every morning she wakes up tired. Once again she pulls the weight of her responsibilities and his. She cooks, she cleans, she bathes the children and then she sleeps. But right before her eyelids close her man showers her with kisses once she was in waiting for but expecting and hoping that each kiss would be lighter than the one from the night before her kisses are not pink they do not smell like rose petals they do not feel like love they taste like alcohol They smell like aftershave and cigarette smoke and they feel like whips because every night he gifts her a purple kiss these kisses that we dream of some men tat them on their women's face her back her arm and her waist if only they weren't purple we too would want to be tatted with kisses those proud marks of intimacy but the tattoo that he places are marks of hate these are more than just rhythmic tappings they are a daily chore to make sure that she never ever realizes her true worth how was your day good Um did you get a call from Ami today? I don't know, I was busy. <laughs> She called Abu was uh, wanting to say thank you for the present. They really liked it. Are you going to call them tonight? I'll do it tomorrow. Can I call Mobi? How's the biryani? <laughs> Thank you.
Is everything okay? Do not understand what I'm saying once? Alia, if you think you're gonna go out, just tell your mom that oh, I I'm so innocent and my husband is such a So what matters aren't the tattoos on his arms, but the ones his mother placed on his heart, by which he knows the true value of a human, let alone a woman. <laughs> It's a Tuesday Monday, now office is closing. It's a little difficult to get out of the office. Yes. Do you have any other questions? Thank you. You're a little bit of a kid. You're a little bit of a kid. Yes. Sir, I can do so much. जी आंटी आ रहे हैं उठती है तो मैं उसे कहता हूँ आपको फोन करें जी अंकल को मेरा सलाम देना अब ध्यान रखो अपना जी अल्लाह फ़ास्ट रमो She invited us to dinner on Tuesday. Told her we're coming. We don't know what to do. It's not good for the baby. Also, we booked your doctor's appointment at four today, so they are done. आपसे एक बात करनी थी कि कोई रिलेशनशिप परफेक्ट नहीं होता ठीक है इंसान को अपनी जिंदगी में बहुत कॉम्प्रोमाइज करना पड़ता है कुछ चीजें आपको समझनी होती हैं और कुछ दूसरे एंड पर अपने हस्बैंड की बात को समझना पड़ता है तो उसके लिए आपको एक स्टेप फॉरवर्ड आना ही पड़ता है अच्छे रिलेशनशिप को घर के माहौल को रखने के लिए प्लेजेंट रखने के लिए बहुत सेक्रीफाइस देनी पड़ती है मेरा बेटा मेरी बात आपको समझ आ रही है ना जी अम्मी
Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just, I'm so grateful that we've all had the opportunity to learn about the real implications that domestic violence can have on real people through this film. And it's truly been an eye-opening experience as we get to be, as we get to learn to be better, better listeners and empathize with those around us. Um, so thank you, really. Thank you. Um, so next up, we are introducing our second artist of the evening, Claudia Shigoya, um, and she is going to, uh, yeah, she's going to take over. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the uh, YW Calgary for, for hosting us and having this awesome conversations. Um, yeah, Mariam, that movie was very, very beautiful and moving. And uh, yeah, I, um, there's a lot of uh, things in common, I guess, with uh, Mexico and other parts of the world, uh, with Pakistan and Canada in regards to, to gender violence. Um, so yeah, I think I'm gonna, gonna should I start uh, sharing my screen? Yep. Just give me a second here. Oops. Okay. Come on. Sorry, just a little bit of difficulties here. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I do anybody see the presentation? Yep. Awesome. Oop. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to introduce a little uh, myself a little bit. Uh, uh, Trinity already did. Uh, introduce a little bit of, of my bio. Uh, well, I'm Claudia Chavoya, I'm uh, from Mexico and I'm a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary artist. Um, and I really enjoy working with sculptures and uh, diverse kind of materials. Um, I usually use textiles and those petals and paper casting and also other kind of traditional materials as drawing, printmaking, um, and yeah, I got a kind of sculpture kind of work. So uh, the work that I'm going to be presenting, um, it's uh, a little bit of uh, my journey through the arts and how I came up with my current project, The Rose for Remembrance. So yeah, uh, so the first work that I'm going to introduce to you, it's a, it's called Unweaving Foundations. Um, so my whole practice uh, talks about uh, gender violence and uh, more specifically feminicide uh, or femicide, which is the killing of women because of their gender. So this term was first coined by uh, Diana Russell and then uh, expanded and expanded its meaning uh, in Mexico with the word feminicide or feminicidio, uh, thanks to uh, activist and writer and author, um, Marcela Lagarde. Um, so, Feminicide has, um, it's not only rooted in, in, gen, in gender, uh, it's the most, uh, the outmost um, kind of gender violence, uh, but in, unfortunately in Mexico, it, it has a lot of uh, violence and, um, I'm sorry, and uh, also re-victimization of these women to media and society. So it's a very complex uh, matter, uh, as well as the way uh, people grieve these cases or these victims. Um, it's a, a, like an open wound, a constant open wound due to, um, as I said, re-victimization of the media and the impossibility of getting justice from um, the system in, in Mexico. So there's a lot of connections uh, with Mexico and Canada uh, uh, in those regards with the missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. Um, so that's why through my practice, I try to create those links and conversations with other communities. So, so this first work uh, on Ravel um, on Weaving Foundations, it's made out of uh, rebosos, which are, uh, traditional um, shawl, a rectangular shawl from Mexico, 
which had a lot of connections with gender, uh, but also with death. Um, a lot of my practice uh, has to do with grief uh, on these matters. Uh, so rebosos um, are a very uh, important part of my of my work when I work with textiles uh, because they're very close and in close connection with women and gender roles as well. Uh, for example, they were used not only for covering from the sun or the or the cold, but also to carry babies or carry big bundles. Uh, and also they were connected with grief uh, with a specific kind of rebosa that it's called luto de aroma, which are traditionally from a city called Tenancingo de Degollado in Mexico state. So in this particular town, those uh, luto de aroma rebosos were used as shrouds. When women didn't inherit them to their daughters, uh, they would be buried with them. So they were a very precious um, piece of textile. Uh, not only because of all these meanings, but because they were weaved, uh, very specially weaved and treated with uh, herbs and plants. Uh, so they had a very subtle smell that uh, never leaves a textile. So it has a lot of those um, very meaningful uh, connections with death and, and women. So this project uh, on women foundations uh, comes from the idea of pondering on how one death uh, affects deeply the interactions of families. Uh, so looking at this uh, fabric, the rebosos as um, Mexico's infra infrastructure, this is a, a representation of the map of Mexico. Um, so the cutting and pulling away of threads is a, in a repetitive manner. It's a representation of the murders uh, that because it's so constant, this violence is so constant, uh, they just it just weakens the whole structure. So that's the idea of, uh, of this process of creation of the work. So I don't know if you can see better with this one, uh, but if you go to my website and click on where the photos of these uh, pieces are, you can find a video that you can watch later that you can see the whole process. So the idea was to have these uh, fabrics and completely unweave them, um, just leaving the silhouette of Mexico. So, um, the more obscure parts of the country are actually just uh, um, th those two uh, parts of the of the fabric that are like cross right? So what I did was to take away the vertical uh, threads out of the fabric and for highlighting these uh, states, which are were the were the ones that had the most uh, cases of feminicide in 2018 in Mexico. Um, I had to unweave. Um, the, one, the vertical ones. So the, it made this piece very, very fragile. And um, still, and I don't know, it has like a very, textiles are very nice because they have this really awesome um, kind of quality of like, you want to touch, right? <laughs> um, and grab you in, into that, uh, see how they're made, right? Uh, so another uh, thing, important thing to mention about this work is uh, that it, has um, aromatic component to it. To it. Uh, so what I did with this piece is that I made a kind of like a perfume that accompanies this piece, which is made out of uh, copal, which is a, res a tree resin uh, that it's uh, commonly used in Mexico as, um, as an incense to pur purify spaces or cleansing. So it's a uh, very similar to how uh, sage is used here as for smudging. So that's um, that's copal, that's how, how we use copal. So I did this uh, special kind of perfume where I used to just spray the, the whole piece and it's like a, um, yeah, it drags you into the piece, drags you into the work and see it more closely, but also to connect deeper because you're not only experiencing the work through uh, your eyes, but also through your other uh, senses. Uh, so that was the idea of that, and also to, uh, in a way, cleanse all this violence that the work is uh, representing again. So um, after uh, working with this project, um, I came up with the idea of uh, still using these uh, garments, the rebosos, in a, in a different way. So 
the next iteration of uh, that process of uh, creative process, but also like uh, this process of grieving um, was uh, the result of uh, this installation titled Noben, uh, which may, uh, has a lot of uh, connections with, um, uh, well, uh, pre-Hispanic uh, traditions of uh, grief and death, uh, but also with uh, mourning, uh, mourning rituals uh, that are practiced in Mexico uh today um so yeah uh these same rebosos represent this uh grief uh but in this case i instead of uh, just unweaving them i crystallize them with, with salt so salt is uh, also another element like copal which is for um purifying but what it's interesting about this material is that um it's not only used for, for it, it preserves but it also destroys um uh, and it's something, it's a uh, used for purifying uh, in diverse rituals. Uh, for example, it's a, you can find it, you can find salt in uh, the Day of the Dead altars for preserving the souls that visit the, the realm of the living um, to stay pure um, before they return. So that idea of uh, something that it's uh, cleansing, uh, but it's also something that hurts and destroys because um, the process of creation of this work was um, constantly kind of like anointing these pieces with salt and water over and over until the, the crystals start build up. So it's a very intense, intense and preparative process as the other one with the cutting and pulling threads. Um, so the interesting part of the salt is that it's something that it's purifying, but at the same time it's burning my hands. So it has a lot of these ideas of uh, preserving and uh, destroying, uh, but also this very bodily function that it's, I don't know, the, um, the pieces in a way, they look like bones and hair. So it's something that also it's cleansing and purifying, but at the same time, it's uh, freezing in time. Uh, so it's gonna also to represent those cases of uh, feminicide, uh, which, the statistics are are very high. Uh, right now, it's eleven women murdered daily in Mexico. So uh, each day, just those cases just push the other ten from before and push them and push them. So it's just freezing this um, this grief. Uh, so it's kind of like a perpetual state of grief. That's what I was trying to represent with these pieces. Uh, so I think in this work, you can see better that uh, thing that I was talking about of how they reminisce, it's like a reminiscence of hair or bones or um, yeah, kind of like a memento of these bodies. So they represent these bodies. Um, this other piece uh, that was part of that installation, um, it was a collaborative piece because uh, besides presenting all these uh, very difficult topics to the, to the viewers, it also invited them to add um, kind of like a little prayer or thought for the families that are grieving. So the idea of this piece was to have the same uh, rebozos but all completely unweaved, so they look like hair, submerging water uh, through the duration of the exhibition where the families can just come by and add a pinch of salt and sympathy for, for the grieving families. So that's, um, I think that's one of the steps that guide me towards a more community engaged uh, um, kind of practice. Um, I also want to mention that this work was accompanied by audio. Uh, so that's something that I really uh, like as well, having those other components, not only um, just visual, but something else that drags you uh, kind of um, gets uh, the viewer uh, like a to a deeper understanding or a deeper connection with the work. So this audio was a mixture of um, of prayers offered for this uh, Catholic ritual, uh, morning ritual from Mexico um, that has its roots to this. Uh, this ritual is called uh, Novenario. So after a person is buried, the families and friends uh, pray for nine consecutive days, uh, all this on the spirits. But what I did uh, was that I um, 
compile all these different voices uh, into like a uh, very um, silent whisper where you cannot really distinguish what they're saying, but you can just understand one of the of the phrases, which is pray for us. Um, but it's uh, conjugated in the uh, feminine uh, voice. So it's also representing this um, constant grief and this impotence uh, from all these uh, injustices. So um, after that work, um, we're still trying to figure out how to better represent the people, how to commemorate them. So another exploration was trying to talk about uh, the statistics. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it, today it's like 11 women murdered daily. Um, so how can I tackle that, that big number to my art? And um, yeah, like involve the community and mourn together. Um, so this project uh, consisted of uh, tiny embroidered roses that represented the statistics. So it was a very performative work as well because I tried to, I started it on October 13 uh, of 2019. Uh, just before the pandemic, and um, and the the statistics uh, to that date it were ten women murdered daily. So every day from October thirteen to October twelve uh, on sorry October thirteen twenty nineteen uh, to October twelve twenty twenty, uh, I embroider embroider ten roses daily. Uh, but in April when the pandemic hit and um, all this violence started to escalate everywhere uh, in Canada, in Mexico, and, uh, all around the world. I changed uh, my embroidery to uh, 11 roses daily. So um, by the end of, uh, of, but of this project, I ended up embroidering uh, 3,855 roses that it's kind of, like a visual representation of all the women that lost their lives to gender violence in that year. Um, but also in a way to commemorate um, each of them. So it was a very painstaking like um, project, uh, but it was also tied to that ritual kind of practice uh, of repetition. And repetition is very important in my practice uh, because it's a way to find meaning for me, uh, find meaning of this difficult topic, this difficult situation, and how I approach grief as well. <clears throat> so this is a, a view of the complete embroidered piece. Um, it is uh, six feet by five feet. Uh, so it's a very huge, uh, kind of like blanket. Uh, it's actually displayed uh, in, an, in a different way right now at the art, Arts Commons, if uh, you're interested in, in watching it. It's, I only, I have uh, the, my current project, but also some past projects installed there too. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, that, that piece took me to that uh, um, idea of how to commemorate and how to uh, involve families uh, more into into this pro into this kind of project. So after that, I started experimenting uh, with for my current project, the Rose for Remembrance, uh, with more still with the rose, but going directly with the with the actual flower. Um, so I first started doing those experiments in 2020. Uh, at the same time, I was doing the, the embroidered roses. So. It is something that I've been doing actually since high school. I've always been very passionate about pressing flowers and preserving flowers, uh, but until now it's when I started doing it more, um, say more professionally or more uh, uh, frequent at least. Uh, so I started just revisiting those ideas that I've been doing when I was like an adolescent. Um, and I started uh, incising words into the petals not really painting them, but incising them. So I started by doing with a needle, all these little 
points to make letters or, or designs and then press them. And, and I was, until that time, it was just there. I, I wasn't sure what, how this break was going to develop, but these were one of the first uh, experiments. And something that attracted me a lot of this kind of uh, work, it was uh, how it shined through the light, uh, because that uh, red petal that says empathy, uh, without a, a light source in the back, you cannot really uh, see that it has anything written. So it's very beautiful when you put them into like uh, into the light, you can see the words and it kind of glows a little. It's, it's a very interesting effect. So I started working with those uh, light sources as well. I started pasting them on windows, uh, still working with the letter, still working what uh, the words would say, um, and also trying to figure out all this, uh, how, how this is going to fit with uh, my, my research topics about gender violence and, and feminism. So it led me to my current work, which, 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 is, uh, which is this one, uh, A Rose for Remembrance. So I started uh, exploring uh, more in depth, uh, thanks to a grant by uh, Calgary Arts Development uh, for this project, uh, which I was, it was a more ambitious project of actually working with the community, with uh, asking the community to submit a name in order for me to uh, imprint it into a rose. Um, so yeah, this, uh, for this project, I selected uh, pink roses, not only because it's uh, easier to read the names, but because of all the meaning that it has behind it. Uh, so it's a, it's a symbol for representing women. It's a symbol for uh, eternal love or eternal memory for someone that has been lost. So all these connections, um, are, uh, they draw me to, into incising red, uh, pink rose petals. So um, with this work, um, my aim is to work with families and individuals um, to commemorate uh, women, girls, uh, transgender women, uh, two-spirit people, and people who identified as female um, that were lost to gender violence. Um, so what I'm doing with this project is uh, that I collect names, uh, dates, um, and a short memory of the person uh, to make make it into this uh, in-person memorial, but also an online memorial through my website, just to link construction that uh, part of the project. So this is a little bit on how they're installed. Um, so from each name that I uh, collect through my website, which has the open call, um, I incise two petals and I make two resin petals. Um, so one of them goes to this, this installation, the one that it's at Arts Commons, this is a prototype, and the other one goes to the family. Uh, so this is how I present them to the families with a cedar uh, wooden base that holds the, the, the little piece. So, yeah, so it was a, it's a very uh, intense, <laughs> you know, like a detailed process as the, the rest of my, my artwork, because it's a, it, it has, it takes a lot of time uh, for incising the names, for pressing them, for sealing the petals, for encasing them in resin, for um, cutting the edges so it, it's, uh, it looks better. Uh, making the holes and doing the installation. It's a, it's a long process that takes a lot of uh, different uh, meticulous steps. Um, and also I want to mention that uh, this project has been guided throughout, uh, throughout, <laughs> throughout this year uh, by traditional knowledge keeper, Cheryl Shaknon Reyes, uh, which uh, she, led this project into a more healing uh, kind of path. Because um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but in my previous work, it was um, very focused on showcasing the grief, but not really having this path of healing, which um, it was very great to uh, have Cheryl uh, guiding this uh, 
in a very respectful way to work with the indigenous community, but also to having this um, alternative tool that pain, right? It's still very painful and still very painful even thinking about uh, happy memories with or lost loved ones. Um, but it's um, a flower offering for them. It's a, it's a way of uh, caring, of remembering and commemorating. It's not precisely going to um, avoid all these uh, horrible cases, but it's uh, remembering or remembrance of these women and that we care and that we're trying to work uh, with the community, right? Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's really my presentation. I have that open call in my website. If uh, anybody would like to uh, collaborate, they can also, uh, you can also contact me through my website uh, or through my Instagram. And then you can see all the information. It, that, uh, the name, the dates, and the, the short story are actually um, Oh, optional, sorry, I'm losing, losing my words. So they're optional. So if people don't feel comfortable sharing uh, the name for the installation, they can just opt for a, another variation like anonymous or name not disclosed or however they prefer. Uh, but the pedal for the family would have the name and that wouldn't be like showcased in, like in the, in the gallery, but still have, will be commemorating this person. Um, also the dates and the story, it's like optional. It's, uh, we're trying to commemorate, not opening more wounds, but trying to uh, giving like this uh, token to, to the families. So thank you very much for listening. I don't know if I, I that's uh, more than half an hour talking. <laughs> thank you so much, Claudia. Honestly, that was so incredible. And, you know, appreciate as well, you know, the offer for, you know, people to also contribute to, um, to, to the piece as well. So that's, that's an incredible opportunity. And honestly, your piece just demonstrates the realities of gender-based violence in our community and across the globe as well. So it's incredible to see the lives of those impacted by gender-based violence being honored in this way. And remember to everybody who's watching, um, you can view Claudia's installation at Art Commons in person until January 22nd. Uh, and so before we move into the Q&A portion with our speakers, I just want to thank everybody again um, for watching today. Your support raises much needed awareness for YW Calgary's programs and services that help thousands of women and families each year. If you'd like to make a donation, you can click on the link that was just shared in the chat box. And thank you again to both Miriam and Claudia for uh, sharing today. Um, it was much appreciated and um, it was really valuable learning for all of us to be able to see um, your film and your, your art piece as well. And so now we'd like to open the floor for questions um, for anybody that's uh, here attending please feel free to um, type some questions in the chat box. Um, we've already received a few, but we'd love to, to hear from more of you. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm gonna start off the Q&A with a question for Miriam actually. Um, and so this question just asks, how can I get involved in issues surrounding family violence? What can I do to start? Um, before I answer that, I just want to say, Claudia, that was amazing, and my heart just is so warmed, and I really want to see your piece, so I'm going to uh, go do that, but thank you for all the contributions you have to this issue, as it's so important. Um, as for the question, um, I think I think that's such a difficult thing, because I can understand that, you know, um, we want to help, and how can we? I think the first thing that I would say on an individual level is like educating ourselves and uh, like raising awareness about the certain issues and why they're important. Because I found that the more education I received, that's when I understood how I wanted to contribute. Um, so I think educating yourself, knowing and just researching what resources are available 
and also learning how to communicate with people um, who you think might be in a situation like that and what you need to do. I think, um, you know, even like just understanding and just being someone who's who's listening to them um, and providing those resources. Like I remember once I was at this job that I used to do, which was on the, like, it was like, um, uh, like sponsoring a child type of like, you know, you do uh, in, in downtown Calgary. And I remember once a woman came to me and she was a, a South Asian woman who was talking about how she didn't have any place to go. And, you know, she had some family violence, things going on. And I remember I wasn't able to help her. I wasn't sure what to say to her. And I was just, as I was, as we were doing this, I remembered her and I was thinking that, you know, if at that time I knew about YW or like these resources, I wish I could have helped her and said, okay, you can reach out to this or that because it's so difficult. And one of the reasons people hold back is because they don't know where to go or what to do or what to say. Um, and they're afraid. So I think um, just knowing what resources are available and what, like what it means and what abuse is and also understanding different cultures and what it means to that. And because it's it's a different way that everyone needs help. So just educating yourself is the best way, I think, um, to raise awareness and helping because opportunities will always show up where you need to contribute. And once you're prepared with that knowledge, you'll be able to do something for it, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you for your wise words, Miriam. Um, our next question is for Claudia. Um, it asks, because your art is influenced by the reality of your culture that you grew up with, what was the feedback like from individuals from that cultural background? Uh, uh, you mean by like exhibiting, I guess ex by exhibiting the work in Mexico or something? Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to showcase my, my work. Uh, this current work in Mexico yet, uh, but I've had conversations with other artists and uh, it's been a, like a, a huge uh, learning uh, experience uh, because, well, I need to acknowledge uh, my privileges when I'm talking about this and acknowledging um, in which position I stand and how am I accompanying the families and how am I um, sharing this issue? Or how am I approaching them? So um, I think that that's like some of the feedback that I've got and I'm working with that and trying to approach this as respectful and, and as honest as possible. Um, I, I would really love to know more about, um, yeah, like if, if it gets exhibited in a, in a gallery in Mexico or, or in a, whatever space in, in Mexico, like I would like to know more in depth and their thoughts. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, it does. Thank, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, the next question that has come in could probably be answered by both of you. Um, and that question would be, how can we normalize conversations about the experiences of violence against women? Okay, I'll answer that. Um, um, uh, sorry, do you mind repeating the question? Yeah, how can we normalize conversations about violence against women? I think, I feel like the only way to normalize that is by talking about it um, more and more. Um, like, I feel like sometimes people can get defensive and, you know, uh, kind of like, oh, this is approached in a certain way. I think it's important that when it comes to these kinds of conversations, there will always be issues with how it's being approached. Um, and, you know, it's, it is important to be careful, like, uh, with when you're talking about it, like Claudia said, like the privilege that, uh, you know, I feel too, like we do have. Um, so it's very important to be aware of um, that. Uh, and I think the only way to normalize it, yeah, I think talking about it, um, understanding what the things are that are holding people back 
and then approaching the topic in a better way that people are more comfortable with or are able to not feel threatened by because the point is to get move forward it's not to attack anyone it's not to be like you're wrong because that's not helping anyone it's about eliminating the issue and whatever needs to be done for that should be done and whether it's the person who's speaking about it is being more empathetic and understanding or the person on the other end is being more open-minded we all have to come work together and i think it's it's a process there's no hard and fast rule um that would just end it so yeah yeah right and claudia do you have anything to add to that yeah, I think so. I, I completely agree with Marianne uh, about yeah talking about it and uh, having like this empathic approach, um, and also uh, again not not revictimizing the women and making it more um, uh, out, like topics like this accessible or more like open to share without like taboos or anything. Uh, because what happens usually in media is that when they talk about gender violence, it's more just to uh, make it like a spectacle. So instead of doing that, approaching it um, with more empathy and talking it uh, honestly, I think it would be better uh, for people to understand and just approach it with more compassion or more uh, understanding of all of the issues. Mm. Yeah, thank you both so much for your answers. Um, we have one again for both of you. Um, and the question just states, how would you encourage other young women to use their gifts to change the world? Um, I think, um, uh, I think, you know, when it comes to, um, if you're asking in a creative way, like arts and creativity is like so subjective and personal, right? Like, um, and I think when you really feel something, um, and you want to express it, just go for it. And it's a process, like whether it's film or whether it's like art projects, like as I'm sure Claudia would say, like it's a process, it takes time. There's different layers to it. Um, and you'll never know what it's gonna look like at the end. Um, what, whatever it's gonna look like, it's gonna be different than one, what, what you started with. So I think it's just a step-by-step -step thing and uh, you just have to have the passion for it, you know, use your, because I think every single person is creative in their own ways. And the more we talk about it, the more people will have to listen and pay attention to it. And the more you make it creative, you know, it can allow people to think differently. And I think the more you think differently, the more you're able to think differently by yourself and not just when someone's presenting it to you. So yeah, just keep, you know, trying <laughs> and expressing it in your own unique way, I would say. Uh, just to uh, repeat the, the question is uh, how to inspire or how would we encourage uh, young, young women, is that? Yeah, just uh, the question was, um, how would you encourage other young women to use their gifts to change the world? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I agree with Miriam <laughs> again and then just like, um, yeah, explore their own uh, creative and um, creative ways. Uh, and then just don't be afraid of share um, what they want to share and their stories. Um, yeah, now, I want to also add, like, just from personal experience, it sometimes it is difficult to even if you want to express it, it can be hard to talk about it, or you would be unsure of how to talk about it, or how much you want to share. And that's something I used to struggle with. Like, I don't know if I want to talk about it. Well, it's like, I, it's like, it, it can be difficult. And it's okay. Like, if you feel like I learned from my experience, if you feel like there's a line you want to draw with how much you want to talk about it, you can because you've already done the part where you express your art. So, you know, it's okay. It's a process. And I think it's important to be give yourself that agency that this is how much I want to share. This is what I want to say. This is how I want to express it. So that's just another thing that people need to keep in mind. Yeah, that's a great point. And thank you both so much for touching on, on that piece. Um, another question that we have that's come in, um, it's kind of a twofold question. So how can we reduce stigma and encourage disclosure? And then, you know, somebody else was curious as to, you know, reducing stigma and encouraging disclosure. Um, 
especially like in the context of culture. So if it's considered inappropriate in the person's culture to talk about these things, how can we reduce stigma and encourage um, the disclosure? Okay, <laughs> so um, I feel like that's a really good question. Um, even when I was making this film, I did a lot of research on it because I felt that like I'm from Pakistan, but initially I was like, okay, what I talk about you know, in Pakistan, but because I've never actually lived in Pakistan, despite how much awareness I have being a Pakistani person, I've always, I grew up in the Middle East and I came to Canada. So I needed to be very careful of how I talk about it um, because the culture is different. And I felt like I didn't have the right to speak about, as, like make a story of someone who's in Pakistan with this issue because it's so sensitive. So that's why I did research on South Asian um, women like over here in Canada and then added, like connected that with also just violence in general so that it's inclusive. So I think that's definitely something important to uh, think about and research on so that, you know, you're not being offensive. And I think when you have a genuine uh, intention, uh, you will get to that point. Like it can get scary, but you all you can do is try your best uh, to be aware. Um, and um, I think the stigma will only uh, go down with you know the more awareness you have, and certain things certain certain things will be uncomfortable. But that's just because of the issue, you know. Again, it's like get comfortable with the discomfort. That's the only way at at some time. So yeah. I'm still having troubles understanding the question. Uh, could somebody or like the person that wrote the question like rephrase it, help me understand it better? Yeah, so, you know, there is stigma attached to, you know, somebody expressing that they've experienced domestic violence, right? Or saying it out loud. Um, and so in what ways can we help um, there be less stigma for people to talk about it. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually that um, relates a lot with the research that I was doing for my, uh, my MFA, um, but it was more into grief uh, that also that uh, when there's this kind of uh, violent deaths or um, tragic deaths, uh, there's a stigma that, that the family has to carry with it. And it says, uh, and uh, it was a book by uh, Kenneth J. Doka. Um, it was titled Disenfranchised Grief, if uh, people is interested in that topic. Um, and he was talking about how uh, this stigma can uh, hurt a lot uh, grieving people. And well, people that carry this stigma of uh, gender violence just alienates them and disenfranchise them from, uh, and just makes it more complex to to solve this uh, this difficult uh, emotions. So what it says it's um, that by creating supported communities or by having uh, people that support you and just uh, can see pass through that stigma, uh, it can help uh, the people uh, to um, overcome this. Like for example, the grieving processes or these. Uh, difficult emotions uh, that come from that um, that isolation. Uh, so yeah, I guess I would be, um, I don't know, and just encourage people to be more empathic with, uh, with others and try to not judge what people go through or what families go through and just be open-minded and supportive. And I think that's what it's very important for, for women and for the community. I want to add um, as well, like with Purple Kisses as well, uh, one thing that I really wanted to like shine light on was like, as you watch in the film that the mom is like telling her daughter that, oh, you just have to put up with it and you have to listen to your husband, all that. I think that's another thing where like, even if we can't help like someone we know, like a friend, but at least within your own families, being more aware and just accepting it. Like that was something that really irked me was why are we not believing the women because some a lot of times people will be like oh it's probably not that bad or she probably did something whatever the reason even if the woman's tired of the guy like you shouldn't be stopping that right there's no reason for somebody feeling like they're stuck in a situation and nobody just comes up and makes up these stories so it's not our job to judge and be the judge and be like okay yeah 
this person seems like they're genuine, I'm going to help them. And this person does not, that's not our place. Our place is to help. So that's another thing where fam with your families or with people, you know, just be more aware and don't think that we can judge because we can, really can't. Mm, thank you both. That was your both, um, you know, really powerful question or answers to a question that is complex and when it's, especially when it's tied to culture and family and values can be incredibly difficult. Um, our next question is for Claudia. Um, and it's surrounding the topic of femicide, but what's something I or anyone else can do to help raise awareness and help prevent femicide? Oh, that's a very difficult question to, to respond. <laughs> uh, at least uh, for what I know in Mexico, it's a, uh, a very complex issue and um, so there's not only like just one way to prevent it right uh, because it's a lot of uh, different kinds uh, this violence comes from different um, aspects not only from uh, partners or family members but also stuff that it's inflicted by the state or by the media um, so <laughs> yeah it's a uh, um, a lot of the work that it's been happening is just like standing with the families, standing with the activists, with the women that are fighting and they're asking for justice, uh, support those uh, those communities. Uh, and I think it goes only not only for the feminist movement or other kind of movements, I guess. It goes for, for all these kind of movements, sorry, that look for justice, uh, just standing along with them, um, demanding justice, uh, pushing and uh, pressuring authorities to, to do their job. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's not like, um, there's also a lot of like programs that can be implemented to, to prevent, uh, prevent that. So I can only speak for, for uh, the Mexican uh, context, uh, but it, yeah, it's like a very difficult uh, thing to, to ask because it's a, it has a lot of things rooted in it, uh, that it's not only just one simple answer of like, well, let's implement like a program in the government that says no violence or something. But that's just uh, one small part that can contribute to start to stop all this, all this thing. So it's a, it's a work that it's going to take a long, long time, unfortunately, but we need to do it. Um, I just yeah, wanted well, to... Well, Oh, sorry, Megan. I was just going to see if I could extend that question. I know, Mary, or sorry, Claudia, you've done a lot of work um, recognizing um, the violence against Indigenous women, spe specifically the missing and murdered Indigenous women in, in Canada. And so in, in that context, is there something that you think we as Canadians can be doing to recognize gender-based violence in our own country? That's also another uh, difficult one, because I I don't want to be talking for that community, but uh, because just being active in our ally, uh, being allies, uh, standing with them, um, attending to the uh, calls for uh, truth and reconciliation, um, and yeah, just like uh, evaluate our own thinking or prejudices or uh, like our internalized racism too, right? Because uh, everybody has to go through like a deconstruction uh, process of uh, acknowledging what they're doing, if it's conscious, conscious or not. Uh, but we just need to, yeah, just try to make ourselves as aware as possible for, for that and yeah. Thanks, Claudia. I do hear, you know, there's, it's multifaceted. So there's various levels of, and ways that we can, you know, help to, to address the issue or things that we can do. Um, but what I'm hearing you say is that it takes community collaboration and some personal work as well. Okay. Um, and so next question is for Miriam. Um, it's related to, you know, your film, Purple Kisses. And so, the question is, how do you imagine what happens next to the characters in your short film? And will we be able to have a link to the movie on YouTube? Okay, so um, the movie's not on YouTube yet. Um, I do plan on at some point to, uh, posting it there. 
and when I do, um, I will share it with you guys as well so you can share it. Um, as for the characters, I think, um, what do I imagine? Well, you know, honestly, it's actually changed over the course of, uh, since I've made the film. At first I was like, okay, you know what's happening. But I think the more knowledge I had, the more awareness I had and the more em empowered I felt, I felt like my characters also changed with that uh, in my mind. Um, so I would like to imagine that um, Alia puts her foot down, tells her mom that you need to <laughs> become more aware and I'm getting out of this situation. Um, or, um, you know, I do, this is a very sensitive thing, but I, so I would do say it with a grain of salt, but um, um, I think every relationship is different. And, you know, there are times where, you know, you can work through a relationship and uh, work through issues. Um, but it is like there, I wouldn't say, like, I think growing up, I've learned a lot. Like, I think when I was younger, I'd be like, no, there's only one way, but um, every relationship is different. So I think it is something that, you know, if Alia and Hassan decided to work through and Hassan realized that he's being a piece of shit, um, you know, then, you know, if there is some change that can happen there, that's possible too. Um, or, you know, you know, Alia realizing that, you know, she had, if she has the support from her family um, and they understand that, you know, this wasn't the right thing because um, nobody should stay in a, a violent situation um and you know marriage especially like from my culture and my religion like what we're taught it's it's a protection it's it's like a happy thing it's a beautiful thing it's not something that should be like negative so I think you know a, a lot of the narrative in my culture is like oh you're married that's it like you know that you you can't get out of it and that's not true and I think people who push for that or people who just don't want to acknowledge that there's a lot of issues like even when making Hassan's character like that was probably the most difficult character I wrote because I had to empathize with him and I really didn't want to but I had to um, and I think in that process I was like okay you know there's always everyone has a story the point is doesn't matter what your story is abuse is not okay you know you, you have an issue go get help see a therapist like you can't react to it by being violent um so I think I would I can't say I don't want to actually just be like this is what's gonna happen with Alia this is what's happening with Hassan um it's a process so uh, I'm hoping that if I had to say today they're happy and uh, in their own way and you know Alia is safe because that's most important I hope that answered the question <laughs> yeah so happy ending is what you're imagining well, safe um, ending for this. Safe ending. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so there's lots of questions rolling in. Unfortunately, we don't have time for all of them, but I would like to ask you both one last question, and that is, how can I learn about other local artists that are educating the public on social causes like you are? Um, sorry, how, how can you learn about other local artists? Yeah, so do you know of any ways or places that we can go to learn about other local artists that are educating the public on social causes or, you know, participating in activism through art? So I would probably give like my, how I find people and from Instagram. Um, I think uh, everyone, Instagram is a way for everyone to con connect. Um, also, I think all these like YW or like other uh, uh, distress center, I think they always, um, uh, you know, if there are people like, for example, I reached out to uh, a distress center when I was for, for their logo and everything. Um, so I think people who are in that field, you know, they'd be trying to connect with um, these resources. So going there is a good way to educate yourself or just on Instagram, like uh, people post about it using hashtags um, or even just Googling, because I'm sure like people would have websites or, um, you know, like links to what they're doing. So yeah, I, I think now with the internet, things are easy to find. So that's that would that's how I would say. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's following hashtags or certain organizations. Um, I've also find uh, for me it was following uh, specific organizations um, or uh, residency programs or galleries or just uh, you can also just visit like galleries, right? Or um, museums and then you 
you'll get surprised. There's a lot of really incredible artists in the in the city. Um, for a specific uh, about uh, gender or uh, gender violence or issues or uh, about women, uh, I know there's a, a residency program at the Women's Center, and there's always featured um, I think from three to five artists each year. So that's uh, going to their website is a, a good way to find uh, those specific kind of artists. There's also, um, I don't know, other kind of uh, uh, nonprofits or organizations that feature, feature work uh, and artists from different backgrounds. You know, for, uh, for example, um, ICA, the uh, Immigrant Council for Arts Innovation or Hispanic Arts, um, I think uh, Casa Mexico it also has uh, some cultural events and artists. So there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things. I would say also arts comments or um, I don't know that there should be kind of like a, a good resource where you can find a, like a lot of those uh, different artists. But I think uh, besides uh, that, it's nice just visiting like a like a place where there's art or like pop up exhibitions. Um, so I don't know, I, I would uh, recommend starting by following some of the uh, art institutions in, in the city or organizations, not like really institutions sounds more <laughs> complex that, I, I don't know, like nonprofits focused for, for artists and, and there's tons and tons of like really talented um, artists in the city. Yeah, um, thank you both so much for, um, you know, what you've been able to share um, I'm not sure if, if everyone's able to see my screen anymore at all, um, but on the screen here, um, you know, is a, is a couple of additional resources um, that are available um, to you this month. Um, something, oh, sorry, I don't know if that was working at all. Was it working? It wasn't working. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, okay, uh, I will just finish up, but I just want to say thank you everyone for all the questions that we shared and then as well to our speakers who have so graciously um, donated their time today. Thank you, Miriam, you know, your incredible film and Claudia, your amazing exhibitions and installations. You both are truly um, inspirations to our community. Um, and the way that you uh, contribute to family violence prevention through your many creative outlets. I know that this is not the last we're hearing of you or seeing of you. Um, so I hope everyone can continue to keep up with them on their social platforms. And thank you to everyone who's joining us today, walking alongside of us as we learn about family violence prevention through different mediums and for your own commitment to violence free living in our city. So as we close, um, I'm going to put up on the screen some available resources that you can access for the rest of the month of November. Um, and you can continue to follow along with the YW Calgary's efforts through our social media platforms or on our website. So thank you all and have a very wonderful evening. Thank you, Trinity and Megan. Thank you very much and to everybody, to the uh, YW. <laughs> Uh, team and, and the viewers as well. Thank you both and thank you everybody. And if you guys want, you can follow me at um, uh, Mary M. Jazz. Um, and then if I do post the film on YouTube, I'll definitely post it there too. So that's one way that you can access that. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. All right, thank you both. I'm gonna hear.